You know, I had a, um, a great opportunity on Friday, Melanie and I did. We, we got to go down uh, with Mrs. Witte, and we got to go to the Faribault Prison and, and to uh, share in a room filled with uh, inmates. And this whole experience, it, it, it really, I mean, it does something to you. It's kind of hard to get it out of your mind after having been there and after having experienced it. Um, it, it was really great. We drove down there uh, bright and early Friday morning. Uh, we, we rode with Jody, and, and we drove down. And we, we went in there. You, you get into the room, and, and Jim helped re me remember at first service the, um, the sally port that you would go through in order to get into the prison where, I mean, you're in the prison. And, and you go in this room, uh, the first thing, the first thing that I hear when we walk in is the, the guy behind in the bubble in this, the, all this glass and in there that the security person, me and Melanie walk in with Jody and he says, Jody, I thought you were bringing a pastor with you today. Like, the heck? I took, I was very offended immediately, immediately. So we walk in and then we had to go through a metal detector. And this was so fun. Because I go through this metal detector, and, and I was kind of nervous. I go through, nothing. I mean, nothing. Just clears a bell, and I'm like, yes. Melanie goes through, beep. She's like, what? So she empties her pockets, all this stuff. And then she goes back through again, beep. And I'm just standing there being the angel that I am, <laughs> observing all of this. So she, she had a, a, like a sweater on with buttons. She's taking that off, goes through again. Beep. I'm like, this is awesome, you know. This is very solid. So, so then she, she, she does. She takes her shoes off. Well, before we got to the shoes, some of you ladies can understand what was becoming the possibility. We won't go into it in depth because it's... A, it's we're, exactly. <laughs> I'm just standing there thinking, this, this is going to get awesome. <laughs> but it ended up being her shoes uh, because there's metal in shoes. I didn't know that. Uh, so she took her shoes off. She walked through. She was fine. Uh, once, once she had everything back in her pocket, sweater on, shoes on, everything. Then we go in through this sally port. And you walk in through this heavy door. You walk in, and the door shuts behind you. And so now you're in this, I don't know, elevator kind of room, and, and, and then they, they check everything, do whatever, and then you go out the other side, the another steel door, it shuts, and now you're in. Now this, you're in the secure area, and there's something that happens in your head. Once you get through that second door, it's like, man, you can't just leave quickly through a place like that. You know? I suppose you could try. I don't think it would fare well. Then you get in, and it's really interesting because Fairbault, uh, the kind of prison that it is, the inmates are, are allowed to walk from place to place. And so we're walking around. It, it's me and these two big burly ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Jody, will you stand up for me? <laughs> this is Jody. <laughs> She's keeping us safe. <laughs> now... No, I know. It, she was going to protect us, no question about it. And, and most of you know my wife. She's not much taller. I mean, she's just a, a little thing as well. And then there's me. <laughs> so I followed those two wherever they went. <laughs> I figured, who's going to mess with these two? It, I mean, it's like TNT, right? It's, or C4. It doesn't take much, but there's a huge bang. That's these two. Uh, so we're there, but it really does give you, it's just this different kind of feeling of, I mean, you're in here, and these, these guys are just milling about, and it's one of those things you just never know. I mean, it was really interesting. Another thing it causes is um, they have a great educational system within the Faribault Prison. Uh, and that, that's what Jody's been a part of and in, in charge of, is this. And, and as you learn about this, it creates kind of this argument in your own mind. Because these guys go and they get an education there. 
Um, some of them come in and they're not even able to read, and they're taught to read, or they have a, a low elementary level of math, and, and they're given this, this math all the way up to where they can get their GED. They also have the opportunity to get, to get vocational training, where they could have, uh, they get some, I, I forget all of them, flooring, drywall, um, cabinetry, some, some wood, woodworking stuff, a whole bunch of different things, IT things. Um, it, it's really great, but therein lies that wrestling match in your mind. Because on one hand, I mean, these are criminals, convicted criminals that are in prison. And you see them having all of this available. And it's like, ah, oh, where does that fit? But the flip side of the coin is this, is they're getting out. And so it's like, okay, so there, there's some positive here because they're being taught and equipped to be a contributing person in our society, which is good. But there's this, this back and forth of, of finding the balance there. And I'll tell you this, having gone and seen it and, and looking at and being a part of the graduation ceremony that they get when they do make these steps, when they achieve these different things, I get pretty excited about it. I get excited about the fact that they're being equipped to come out and contribute instead of just being put back out to drain. Because to me, those are two very different things. And I got excited about it. That's, that's why Melanie and I were there. I was invited to, to speak at that graduation service. And you get up there, and, and now understand this, on the way down, I, I, I got to do this a couple years ago. And when I did it a couple years ago, I mean, I, I was terrified, you know, to do it. I was nervous. I, I've never stood in front of a 150 inmates before. I know as I look around, some of you have. Um, <laughs> it was good to see nobody from church there. I'll let you know that. <laughs> but last time I was there, I just stood. <laughs> I just stood at the podium. Kind of nervous, kind of, I really was. And I just said my thing. Well, this time on the way down, I said, Jody, so, you know, what can I do? <laughs> you know, how free can I be here in this setting? And she says this, you can do whatever you want to do, she said. I'm like, <laughs> right on. So I went into this like I was here. <laughs> Just like, okay, well then I'm, I'm going to engage these guys, I'm going to do this. So I get up there, and it was no different. I, never, I don't think I ever once stood at the podium. I grabbed that handheld mic, and I just started meandering around. And I'm walking up and down this, this center aisle and on the sides, and, and it's packed solid with inmates, prison inmates. And I'm just marching right down the center aisle, and I'm talking to these guys. Kind of just forgot where I was for a second. I just made myself at home. And I said this to these guys. I said, you guys, I can't tell you how much of an honor it is to get to stand here and speak into your lives. The pleasure and the privilege that it was to be there. And it was real. It's like going to Teen Challenge or having Teen Challenge here or having folks from Hazelden here. Because it ain't about church. It's about real life and it's about right where they're at. And to me, that's so stinking exciting. I mean, to be in that environment and be able to speak to these people, man, it was unbelievable. It was so amazing. I look at these people, and I see a room full of potential. I see a room full of possibilities. And that's the way I spoke to them. It was so perfect because as we were walking up to the gymnasium where the service was going to be held, the, the music team, which, just so you know, I invited them to come lead worship here sometime. <laughs> just relax. I'll let you know before they come. But I'll tell you this, honestly, watching these guys, I was watching this drummer. There's this drummer there. He's this little bald guy, so I was automatically attracted to him. Handsome devil. <laughs> handsome, handsome guy. He's sitting there, and he's drumming away. And I'll tell you what, I was thinking he's, he could lead worship. Do you know why? Because he was sitting there, and he was having a blast doing what he was doing. It made you want to be a part of what he was doing. I mean, he was drumming away.
I mean, he was just going to town in a smile. and I mean, he had rhythm, but he was getting it done. And it made you want to be a part of it. And I thought, dude could lead worship. Who cares about his past? He could lead worship. And I spoke to these, or the song that they were doing as we walked up, it was the song, um, This is your life. Are you who you want to be? They were singing that song, and they, were, they sang that right before I got up. And I'm like, Lord, this could not be any more perfect. I mean, that's one of my favorite songs. You guys have heard me play it here in church. It's an amazing song. The message in that song is like, ah, it made me want to come unglued for like 45 minutes. And I got up and I said, that song is so true for you guys. And as I'm thinking in my head and in my heart that I see a room full of potential and possibilities, I can't help but thinking what they think is, I am never going to be anything more than who I am right now. That's it. I'm never going to achieve anything. I'm never going to be think anything other than just an inmate, just some guy that wears blue all the time. I'm never going to be any different. And what I wish I would have been able to say was God can change your life forever. I wish I would have been able to have that opportunity. And that's why I invited them all to church. <laughs> I did, all of them. I said, when you get out, you come visit me. Because they need to know that all things are possible with God. Right? You know, it's funny because as I look around, I don't see that many different faces than what I saw Friday morning. For real. We're not that different. Right? We're not. It would be against all odds for their life to be different than it is right now. It would be against all odds for anything to change and be different. Friends, that's the name of my that's the title of my message today, this morning. Against all odds. Because I know this, that as I spoke to those inmates about just the opportunity they have to change, I started by telling them this story, actually. Some of you have heard it before. I told them a story about this hound dog that's, that's on this porch. This insurance guy goes out to this old, this just old guy that's out in the country because he, he needs to change his homeowner's insurance. And so he calls in the, insur the insurance guy, just kind of a young, hotshot guy, uh, kind of like me, just kind of goes out there. And he goes out, and, and he gets out of his car, and he's walking up to this old house, and he notices this hound dog laying on the porch. And, and as he's walking up, he sees, or he hears this hound dog just, just kind of howling away. You know, hound dog. I mean, that's a lame hound dog, but you know what I mean. But this dog is just laying there, and he's just whining and just howling. And, and so the young guy kind of just kind of looks at him as he walks by, and the dog just lays there doing this. So he goes into the house, and, and he has this meeting with this old guy. He doesn't say anything about the dog. And then as he's leaving, he walks past this hound dog again. Same thing. The dog's just laying there. The guy's like, wow, well, what the heck is the deal? He leaves, and a couple days later, he comes back to get the papers signed. He drives up, he gets out of his car, he's walking up to this old house and he sees the same thing. This old hound dog is laying there, his ears drooped over, and he's laying on the porch, same place. He's just like, man, what is the deal with this dog? So he walks by him, goes into the house, meets with the old guy, they sit down at the table, they have their coffee, they get the paper signed, all this stuff is done. And, he, and the young guy says, man, he's thinking to himself, I got to find out what the deal is with this dog. And so he finally gets up the courage. He says, sir, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but i got to ask you this question. He said, what's the deal with your hound dog out there? He just, on Tuesday when I was here, he was laying in the same spot, just, just, just whining and kind of howling, you know, like he's in pain almost. And then I come back today, and it's the same thing. He's like, what, what's wrong with him? And, and the old guy says, yeah, he says, that's old Red. He said, he... Um, it's really kind of funny, but he's, he's laying on a, on a nail. There's a, one of the nails on a deck board is kind of sticking out, and it's kind of jabbing him in the side. 
It obviously hurts him, but he says it must not hurt bad enough to where he's actually willing to move. <laughs> and I think that's one of the greatest stories ever because how many of you are the hound dog? It's funny, but it's true. How many of us are laying on the same stinking nail we've been on for five years, but we're too lazy to get off the nail that's jabbing us in the side and change it? It's comfortable, but it's miserable. But friends, listen, here's, here's something, a little side note. Every time you come to church, any time that I, I'm around, any time you go anywhere, I want to challenge you to do something. Leave with one thing. Take at least one thing with you. My wife taught me that. I used to go to these seminars and listen to these people, and I'd be just going into it. I'd already have a negative attitude. And she said, well, just, just try and take one thing away. Just, just take something. Go into it with that mindset. You're going to take something. All right, it's a good idea. I want to pass that on to you. One thing today. Take one thing away today. And here's why I say this now in the service, in the, in the message. is because that story of that dog may be the only thing you remember for the next three hours of me talking. And that's going to be your one thing that you take away, is the story of that hound dog. And friends, I hope, and I am totally okay, if that's the one thing you take away, if it causes you to get off your nail and do something different. Change something. If you've been laying on that nail that's been driving you crazy, do something about it. Don't just lay there. Because that gets us nowhere. And I told that story to these inmates, thinking, you guys, some of you, you've been in this process. How many times? We met one young man. This was his second time in that prison. And he said, this time it's going to be different because he said, I'm actually doing something with it. He's getting an education and he's doing... But I challenge him, do something with it. Don't let what you've done dictate where you're going. What you've done is done. Let it be there. But don't let that be what dictates your future. And I said that to 150 plus inmates. And friends, I say the same thing to the church today. And that's what I mean by when I look around, the faces aren't that different. All that's different is really the address and the circumstances. But there are so many things that are alike. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Against all odds, every one of them has an opportunity to change their life and be different. Every one of them. And friends, whatever you brought in here today too, that message is the same for you. Even if it's against all odds, it can change and it can be different. Amen? Amen. 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 Turn with me in your Bible to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Again, like I said, the title of my message is Against All Odds. And I want to look at this, this story in Judges briefly. It's about, it's about uh, Gideon. And, and just a little bit while you're turning to Judges, just a little bit about Judges. Um, judges, is, it's, it's about that. It's about a group of 12 judges that led Israel over this course of time. Uh, you're familiar with Moses. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt up to the Jordan where they were going to go into the promised land. Then Joshua took over. Then the Bible says after they did that, Joshua died, and then a whole generation came up that knew not of God or of his mighty works. And so the Israelites were in this up and down, away from and with God all over the place. And when that happened, God sent judges to help them rule. God sent judges to help guide the Israelites. That's where we are in the Bible here. And actually, just before this, you're familiar with uh, Gideon and laying out the fleece? That happened just before this part here uh, that we're, we're going to look at. But Judges, chapter 7, verse 1. We're just going to read verse 1 through 7, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. It says this. It says, Early in the morning, Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me, 
that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. And I want to stop there for a minute because I want you to understand something here. A lot of times we go through the Bible, we just read it, and, and we just go through it. It's like, yeah, whatever. But I want you to understand the setting here. Right before this, Gideon had prayed to the Lord about going to battle against the Midianites. God said, yes, you're going to go to battle. Okay, so that's all set up. So now here's Gideon. Gideon's there, and he's got this army, if we add this up, of, of over 30,000 people. Over 30,000 is, is the army. And I want you to have battle in mind. I don't want you to have, you know, sending rockets from F-16s and, and sending, you know, from, from aircraft carriers. I want you to have battle in your mind. I want you to be thinking Braveheart right now type of battle. Because that's what these guys are about to face. That's where they find themselves is in that situation. And the reason why I'm so emphatic that I want you to have that in your mind because I want you to understand what God is saying to Gideon right next. There's 30, 32,000 Israelites that are going to go down against the Midianites. And God says this, and I want you to wrap your mind around this. God says there's too many, Gideon. I want you to weed through them a little bit, and I want, I want a bunch of them to go home. So he does. And 22,000 leave. And here's what I want you to wrap your mind around. Number one, how about the 10,000 that are left? They're watching two-thirds head home. I'd be standing there going, hold on. I wasn't afraid before. Now I'm scared. 22,000 of those soldiers left. This is what God is telling Gideon. Against all odds is the name of the message today. God is saying, send 22,000 home. Let's keep reading, because it gets better. Uh, so 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. Going on in verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, listen, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So here's what he does. So Gideon took the men down to the water. Then the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. Okay, so I want to paint another picture for you. And I'm actually going to do this, yes. Here's what he sent him to the water to do. Get down on, you know, you're, you're coming up to the, the water, right? Now, the majority of them got down and they just started lapping it up. I, I know, I'm doing it, but it's a picture you need to see. <laughs> just go with me here, okay? Put the camera away, Keith. <laughs> Good grief. Unbelievable. <laughs> so then, but here's what the other guys is, and here's why I'm showing you this, because it's going to make a lot of sense to you. So you had the ones that just stuck their face down to the water and started lapping it up like a dog. But then you had the other ones that put their hands in the water and kept their eyes up, paying attention, and then drank out of their hands. You can tell the difference in the, in the soldier, you can tell the difference in the person. One of them totally lost sight of what was going on around them. The other one kept their eyes on what was going on, grabbed the water out, and then drank, but never lost sight of what was happening. A, a better, maybe more trained soldier. So the Bible goes on to say this. 300 of them did it this way and looked around. 300. The other 9,700... Just went in like a dog. So what does God say? He says this. The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Gideonites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Three. 
Friends, I want you to have this picture in your mind. Don't just sit in church right now. Don't get tired. Stay with me just a few minutes. I know you're tired. I know it's cold. I want you to hear this clearly. You came. I want you to leave with something today. It starts off with 32,000 people that have assembled to go down and to fight this battle against the Midianites. This bloody in your face, hand to hand, we're going to battle, we're going to fight this out. People are going to die and they're going to bleed. It's ugly and it's messy. 32,000 going down. And then God says, that's too many. So 22,000 leave. Now there's 10,000. Then God goes even farther and he says, do you 9,700, you get to go home too. Gideon is there with these 300 guys to go fight the Midianites, which is absolutely amazing. The Bible says, if you read farther down, the Bible says that just the number of camels that the Midianites had were, were like the sand. It's just a picture of how many were there in the Midianite army. My friends, this is crazy. Are you with me on this? Do you understand the picture that I'm painting for you? This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy that God would expect these 300 to go fight them. It is crazy. It's crazy to think that somebody who, who is a lifetime inmate at prisons, it's crazy to think that a drug addict, it's crazy, to, it's crazy to think that people can be changed, but the Bible says that all things are possible with God. And that is what this testifies to. That's why God was doing this to Gideon. Why? So that it would be obvious that it was only through God that this happened. That's it. That's the only way that this battle gets won. Against all odds, this happened. Against all odds, and you're gonna, I know you'll go home and you'll read the chapters around this later on today or tomorrow morning, but you're going to see that the Israelites go down and they take the Midianites. And God is involved. And God makes it happen against all odds. And you know what I, I get fired up about inside is this. What's going on in your life? What's going on in your world? What's going on today in this life right here? Because, friends, that's real. And if you live in a world where you think the Bible's fairy tale, I want to challenge you on that. I want to challenge you that this is real, that this happened, this battle took place, and that God gave them victory that day against all odds. So to the church, what's going on in your life that God can give you victory over? Against all odds. In real life, on Monday morning, not sitting here in church when it looks good, but on Monday morning, that thing that, that God can do. If you think, of, think through the Bible, you, you think of, of Noah and what he did. You think of even the disciples, this ragtag group that Jesus threw together against all odds, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. Talk about the Apostle Paul. Against all odds, it's crazy. It is crazy off the charts ridiculous that God chose him to write so much of this. Right? The guy that persecuted Christians to death, that God chose him against all odds that his life could be changed to the point where God uses him as a mighty tool to reach the Gentiles. It's crazy. It's against all odds. But friends, that's God. God is the against all odds. God changes everything. And I, and I, wish, I wish I could have just gone crazy on Friday morning with that message to these inmates. Because I believe that every one of them has the opportunity and the possibility to have a changed life if God is in it. Amen? There's a few, few thoughts that I, I have because as I continue on, I think, okay, God, I see Gideon and I see Paul and I see the disciples and, and no, I see these guys. 
So what about me? That's what I think. I think, God, what about me? I, I, I want to be that. I want to be used, God, like you used Gideon. I, I want to be the guy that's against all odds, Lord, that you give an opportunity to do something amazing to. I, sometimes I think I, I am one of those guys. When I look at where I was and, and look at where I've come now, I think, God, against all odds, this is happening. I, I know most of you, or a lot of your testimonies. Against all odds, you guys are sitting here. Against all odds, maybe you're still married. Against all odds, you're still alive, for crying out loud. And that's real. But I think, God, what, what about me? What about us to be that? And when I look at, like I look at Gideon, there's these four things that, that came to mind that, that I want to make sure I have in my life that I want to share with you. Just four things that I think we can learn from Gideon. The first is this. It is obvious that Gideon had a relationship with God. Right? Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. But here's the challenge I have for you, the church, today. Again, I want to challenge this. I think Gideon had an everyday relationship with God. I'm going to, I'm going to go way out on a limb here and think that Gideon did more than just go to church on Sunday morning. I might be stretching it. I mean, that's just what I'm getting from the Scripture. That kind of relationship, I'm going to guess, takes place more than just going to church Sunday morning. I'm thinking he did something Monday that had to do with God. I'm thinking he did something Tuesday that had to do with God. He had an everyday relationship with God, and that's what gives, gives him the foundation to stand on moving forward. An everyday relationship with God. The second thing is this, is you have to trust Right? You have to trust God. Because Gideon lays the fleece out, and go back at the end of chapter 6 of, of Judges, and you'll see Gideon laying the fleece out. He lays the fleece out, and one night he says, Lord, if this is really what you want me to do, then I, then I want you to have the ground be covered in dew and all wet, but keep the fleece dry. And then I'll know. Okay, so he does that. The next morning, Gideon gets up, okay, this is kind of cool. But God, I still really need to know that this is you. So he comes before him, and, and he's humble about it. Lord, don't get mad, but can you, can you do that again? <laughs> he says, only this time can you do the opposite. Can you have the ground be wet? Or I don't know what I said first time, but the opposite. Can you do the opposite? And, and the Lord does. Okay, so Gideon gets that. But now here's the deal. Gideon has to trust what God's going to tell him to do, right? Put yourself in Gideon's shoes. Keith, imagine you're Gideon. Arlie, you're Gideon. Adam, you're Gideon. And, and you're there and you're like, God, I'm, I'm your man. Okay, 22,000 are leaving. Are you still God's man? And I mean for real life right now. Because it's not Sunday morning church when we have all the right answers and it all looks pretty. This is real life battle. Are you still God's guy? Then God says, Kevin... 9,700 are leaving. It's you and 300 guys. Are you still God's guy? Are you still going to trust? God, I, I trust that you're in control. Because to me, that comes from an everyday faith. It comes from living and knowing God on Monday and on Tuesday and on Friday, not Sunday morning. The third thing is this, is having faith. Having faith that God can do what He says He's going to do. Having faith that, that God is in it and believing that. The fourth thing is this, is having the courage to step out. And this was the other thing I told these inmates. I, I can't imagine the journey that they are on. I can't. I can't imagine what it's like to come out of prison and have to get back into the world. To be a part of it. I can't imagine that journey. And I shared with them that this, Moses came out and, and held up his staff and God separated the Red Sea. God did something amazing. He opened an amazing door for them to be set free from the, the Pharaoh and his army that were chasing them after they were freed from Egypt. He did an amazing thing. But here's where the courage comes in. Friends, it wasn't a slip and slide or a water slide that they got on to get down. This was a journey. This was courage to say, okay, God, I'm going to step down into this. And, and the courage it took to get down in between the water on both sides, knowing at any moment 
God can flood us out and we'd be dead. The courage it takes to take that little step to walk through that which God has opened for us. That little step it takes, the courage to get to the point where, God, I have faith and I believe that you can do all things. Jesus said all things are possible with God. Philippians 4.13 4, 4, says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Great scripture, but do you believe it? And to continue one little step at a time, walking even when it's scary, walking even when it's intimidating, even when it's uncomfortable, and having the courage to take those steps. And friends, sometimes that is the most difficult step to take, is the first one. And this morning, I want to challenge you against all odds. What is God asking you to do? Against all odds, what is the burden that you carry that you don't want to let go of? And believing that against all odds, God can do something with that. And then to believe that God can use you. You know, I, I, I want to encourage all of you that God can use you. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your lifestyles were. I don't care. I believe that God can use you. When we have a heart of repentance and a heart that comes before him and just says, God, I want to follow you. I believe that he can, against all odds, take us and use us, every single one of us. And friends, I hope today that you believe that. I pray that whatever it is that you came in here with, that in, in real life, that God does something with you. And truly that we leave a little bit different. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you guys stand and let's just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you, God, that, um, God, that we have examples like Gideon. Examples of your goodness, examples of your faithfulness. God, examples of your power and your might. Father, that we don't have to have this picture of weakness of our God, but that you are awesome. And Father, we ask this, that each of us, as we leave, that you would go with us. And Lord, if you've stirred something in this place today, Father, that it would continue as we walk out those doors. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.